It is January 14th, and 164 years ago, on January 14th, 1858, Italian revolutionaries attempted to assassinate the Emperor of France, Napoleon III. And if that sounds like an exciting event, understand that it was probably not even close to the most exciting event in the life of one of the would-be assassins. Because say whatever you want about Carlo Camilla de Rudio, he lived an exciting life. His is a ripping yarn that deserves to be remembered. Carlo Camillo de Rudio was born in Belluno, Italy in August of 1832, then part of the kingdom of Lombardy, Venetia, under the control of the Austrian Empire. He was the son of aristocracy. His father was a count of the Austrian Empire, his family having first obtained title from the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II in the 12th century. However, the family was impoverished. A biographical record written in 1902 noted that his family included seven sons and seven daughters. A young man in his position had few options other than soldiering, and at the age of 13, he enrolled as a teenager in the Imperial College of Cadets in Milan, where, according to the 1902 biography, he was thoroughly grounded in military tactics and the science of war. 1848 was a period of great change throughout Europe as a wave of revolution swept the continent in what has been called the Wave of the Peoples, or the Revolutions of 1848. In Italy, this took the form of a rebellion against Austrian rule on the part of Italian nationalists. The revolution came to Milan in March with the so-called Five Days of Milan, beginning the first Italian war for independence. The popular uprising managed to expel the city's Austrian garrison. When his school was attacked, writes antiquarian Victoria Daly in a 2014 issue of the Los Angeles Review of Books, de Rudio refused to fight against his own countrymen and was imprisoned the first of many incarcerations in the beginning of his decade-long life as a revolutionary. Another account claims that he deserted the Austrian army after killing an Austrian officer who had raped an Italian girl. In any case, the young man joined the insurgents and made his way to Rome to join the forces of the revolutionary leader Giuseppe Garibaldi. The conflict, called the Risorgimento, meaning resurgence, was complex and affected by shifting alliances. When Garibaldi's revolutionary army caused the Pope to flee, the Papal States were briefly transformed into a liberal republic, the Republic of Rome. This drew the involvement of the newly elected President of France, Louis Napoleon, nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, pressed by French Catholics to restore the papacy. When France eventually prevailed in the siege of Rome in 1849, de Rudio, by now an experienced officer who, according to the 1902 biography, had served at the front and in various sieges, was forced into exile. His adventures in this period are too numerous to describe them all. As the blog Emerging Civil War notes, the mid-1850s were difficult times for European political refugees as the forces of conservative reaction and royal privilege regained their dominance and dampened enthusiasm for further revolts. He had made it to Paris in 1851 when Napoleon III proclaimed himself emperor in a coup d'etat and spent some time fighting with the resistance there. He escaped to Switzerland by walking alone across the Alps. He operated as a spy and as a soldier, was captured in prison several times. By some accounts, he tried to travel to the United States in 1854, only to be shipwrecked off the coast of Spain, an adventure from which he was lucky to survive. In 1855, he was living in London, where many Italian revolutionaries had fled. He married an Englishwoman named Eliza, the niece of an Anglo-Irish couple with whom he was staying. He married in December 1855. He was 20, and she was 14. The couple would eventually have four children. His life in England was what you would come to have expected of de Rudio, as Daly simply notes, after many adventures, including surviving being stabbed, de Rudio and Eliza moved to Nottingham. Marrying an English bride would eventually save his life. In England, he became involved in a plot by Italian revolutionary Felice Orsini, who had become convinced that France under Emperor Napoleon was the biggest obstacle to Italian independence. Orsini devised bombs made of fulminate of mercury that would explode on impact, and in Paris on January 14, 1858, he, de Rudio, and another accomplice threw those bombs at the carriage of the Emperor and Empress as they were headed to the opera. The New York Times wrote, The scene which ensued can be more easily imagined than described. It was a confusion of horror and excitement. The explosions were loud, deafening, and shook the very earth. The attacks killed eight people, injured around 150 more, but failed to kill the emperor. The three were quickly arrested and sentenced to be executed. This might have been the end of the man who had already survived so much, were it not 
for his English wife. Eliza worked diligently to have his sentence commuted and eventually drew the attention of Queen Victoria, who, sympathetic for the young wife, appealed on his behalf with the Empress Eugenie. On the day he was to be executed by guillotine, Derudio was led to the platform with the guillotine, where he made a last request. The Bismarck North Dakota Tribune wrote in 2008, He said farewell to his wife and child, and as a last favor, asked that he be allowed to smoke his pipe. The executioner filled the pipe for the doomed man, placed it in his mouth, and gave it a light. Daly then explains what happened next. As he smoked, a messenger suddenly rode up on horseback, dismounted, and spoke quickly to the authorities. Derudio was immediately led back to his cell. The empress, it seems, had managed to convince her husband to commute his sentence in an attempt to appear merciful and boost his reputation with the public. Derudio had made another improbable escape. Daily writes, Had he not requested his pipe, the messenger would have been too late. His compatriots had not been so lucky. The two other bomb throwers were beheaded. But a commuted sentence was not so much the reprieve as it might sound, as Derudio was sent to the infamous French prison in French Guiana called Devil's Island. Life was particularly brutal at the penal colony. The blog Prison History explains, among the various penal colonies that were formed in over the last few centuries, Devil's Island in French Guiana represents one of the most notorious ones. The blog goes on. Although officially this penal colony carried the name Bani de Cayenne, its prisoners soon coined the name Devil's Island. The name was perfectly created to reflect the situation in which prisoners found themselves on this island. The website Headstuff notes, the French had first laid claim to the territory of Guiana in 1763 and had tried to colonize it normally. But this had ended after 10,000 of the first 12,000 settlers died within a year of tropical disease. Daly explains, the living conditions in the penal colony were brutal. Prisoners were fed very little and the food was often rotten. They were whipped, chained, and beaten and were at times put into pits in the blistering sun. The few clothes they were given soon became nothing more than rags, at which point prisoners often worked without any clothing. Generally, the only way to escape from French Guyana was to die. In fact, the waters through which you'd have to escape were so shark-infested that that's the way that the guards disposed of the bodies of all the prisoners who died of disease and starvation. Supposedly, the guards rang a dinner bell to call the sharks when they threw bodies into the ocean. The danger of the conditions was demonstrated when one of Derudio's early plans for escape was foiled, as Daily writes. They were nearly ready to flee when some of the convicts came down with yellow fever, including all nine members of Derudio's crew. Of the 600 prisoners and guards of the prison at Montagne d'Argent, only 63 survived the outbreak. One was Derudio. Again, the intrepid revolutionary proved hard to kill. Still, conditions were so bad that a newspaper reported that the notorious would-be assassin had died of a fever. Eliza thought that her husband was dead. Very few prisoners ever escaped French Guiana, but among them was Carlo de Rudio. He and some other prisoners managed to hijack a fishing boat and sail more than a thousand miles to British Guiana, where they gave them asylum. They went for days without food and water. They were nearly marooned on a muddy shoal, but once again, improbably... De Rudio had managed to survive. And his adventures had certainly not ended. He managed to return to England and was reunited with Eliza in February 1860. But he had difficulty feeding his family, making a living giving lectures about his experiences. In 1864, he moved to the United States, hoping that his military experience would gain him a commission in the Union Army. Italics Magazine wrote in 2020, as a Republican and former prisoner, Charles loathed the institution of slavery and felt it was his duty to fight the Confederacy. In the United States, he anglicized his name to Charles. A commission was difficult to get late in the war, and he served as a private in the 79th New York Highlanders Volunteer Infantry. He received a bounty for enlisting, which he used to send for his family. The Sacramento Bee wrote about his service in 1910. Although the four-year struggle was nearly over, the new recruit was a conspicuous figure in the engagements of the armies of Sheridan and Grant during the closing months of the war. His bravery was so manifest that he was chosen from the ranks to execute missions of the most hazardous character and finally was commissioned a second lieutenant by General Grant. The commission was with the 2nd United States Colored Troops. After the war, DeRudio worked as a clerk and in 1866 earned his United States citizenship, but he still wanted to serve a career in the Army. In 1867, he earned a position in the regular Army as a second lieutenant, but then it was rejected following a physical which claimed that he had a retracted right testicle. 
leading daily to quip that it seems after all he had been through, DeRudio lacked the balls to be an officer in the United States Army. Actually, many historians speculate that the rejection had nothing to do with the physical and that the army had figured out his revolutionary past and decided that it might be unseemly to have a U.S. Army officer who had attempted to blow up the Emperor of France. But he was persistent and found two doctors who, daily writes, agreed that there was nothing wrong with his man parts which would in the least interfere, whether in marching on foot or horseback, nor in any posture, and there is not even the slightest probability that it will ever incommode him during the remainder of his life. He also, emerging Civil War rights, was able to enlist the support of newspaper publisher Horace Greeley to his cause, and his retraction was itself retracted. DeRudio was commissioned a second lieutenant in the U.S. 7th Cavalry. He was one of many European immigrants to serve in the 7th Cavalry on the frontier. He was, by all accounts, a good and diligent officer. Daily writes that DeRudio, used to following orders, was known as a diligent, hard-working soldier. He didn't drink or gamble. He was a family man. But he was disliked by other officers of the unit, especially the 7th Cavalry's brash and famous commander, George Armstrong Custer. Emerging Civil War notes that other officers called him Count No Account, referring to his aristocratic heritage, an empty bank account. The officers might have found him self-aggrandizing, but Daly notes that DeRudio was a popular, soft-spoken raconteur with European manners. He must have irritated the aggressive and vain Custer. Custer himself called DeRudio a natural conspirator. In 1875, DeRudio was promoted to first lieutenant, and that was his rank when, in the summer of 1876, the 7th Cavalry was sent on a U.S. Army campaign to force Lakota and Cheyenne back onto their reservations. When, on June 25th, Custer decided to attack a large Native American encampment along the Little Bighorn River, DeRudio was assigned to the battalion under the command of Major Marcus Reno. In his account of the battle, Sergeant Thomas O'Neill of Company G wrote that General Custer ordered Major Reno to take his battalion of three troops to the other side of the stream and attack the camp. And I will support you, are the words he used. Reno's force followed orders and charged, only to find a much larger camp than they had suspected. O'Neill wrote, We could see the extent of the village and the immense number of Indians it contained, and how impossible it appeared to be for us, about 130 or 140 men, to attempt to charge through such a superior force. Reno's men dismounted to fight in a skirmish line, a defensive line, but at risk of being overrun, Reno ordered, O'Neill wrote, Get to your horses, men. O'Neill wrote, Every man of our small command seemed to realize fully the desperate situation we were in. It was hand-to-hand -hand conflict, he recalled, both Indians and troopers striving to pull each other from their horses, after employing their weapons, and both succeeding. In the middle of what he described as a perfect pandemonium, O'Neill's horse was shot, and he found himself being left behind by his comrades. He wrote, then I determined to see if I could not reach the thicket out of which we had just ridden. So I turned around and legged it that direction, expecting every moment would be my last on earth. But as he reached the thicket, I found myself face to face with Lieutenant DeRudio. Like myself, his horse had been shot from under him, and he had an experience similar to mine in reaching the thicket. Along with two others, a civilian scout and an interpreter who managed to keep their horses, O'Neill and DeRudio hid in the thicket. O'Neill wrote, The lieutenant kept his keen eyes on all points and encouraged us to be cool. Men, he said, we have to die sometime, and we will die like brave men. But I am hope we will get out of this scrape yet. An account attributed to DeRudio, published in the New York Herald, said, I could not believe that I had been preserved to end in so unjust and obscure a manner. The two civilians would eventually leave them, retreating on their horses, and DeRudio and O'Neill would have what the Herald described as a thrilling tale with 36 hours of suspense. The two hid as they made their way towards where they thought Reno had retreated. They were discovered several times, but were able to chase off attackers and escape. They saw dead cavalrymen being mutilated after the battle, and at one point mistook a group of warriors wearing uniforms they had taken from the dead as fellow cavalrymen. O'Neill said that our escape on this occasion was simply miraculous. The odds seemed overwhelming. O'Neill wrote, I never expected to get out of this place alive. For his part, DeRudio told him, I would not care so much if I were alone, but what will my wife and three young children do if I get killed? After some 36 hours of desperate searching, the two made it back to what was left of Reno's troop in what historian Earl Brennanstuhl called a thrilling escape. Calling DeRudio one of the coolest and bravest men I ever saw, O'Neill wrote, Often, when I begin to think about all we went through during those trying 36 hours of mental torture there in the river bottom, I wonder if it is possible that it all actually did happen, or if it was some terrible nightmare. Charles DeRudio once more cheated death at the Little Bighorn, ironically because George Custer didn't like him. 
Derudio should have been in command of Company E, but Custer moved him under Reno, presumably to keep him out of Custer's command. Had he been with Company E instead of Reno, he likely would have died along with the rest of the men who accompanied Custer. Derudio served another 20 years in the United States Army. He served in the Dakota Territory, but also in New York, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, the Arizona Territory, and New Mexico. He was promoted to captain in 1882 and retired in 1896 at the age of 64 when he was promoted to the rank of major. He moved to San Diego and then eventually to Los Angeles. In 1898, when the Spanish-American War started, he asked to return to active duty, but was refused. In Los Angeles, he lived what Italics magazine called a celebrity retiree life. By then, he was his parents' only surviving son. The 1902 biography noted the title of Count has descended upon him, but titles not being in the spirit of American independence, he prefers to be known by his military title of Captain. That biography, included in a historical and biographical record of Southern California, described him as a brave defender of our nation's welfare. He represents the highest type of our adopted citizenship, courageous and resourceful in war, and public-spirited and progressive as a private citizen. Charles C. DeRudio passed away from natural causes in Los Angeles, California in 1910 at the age of 78. In his obituary, the Sacramento Bee wrote that he was well known in the city for his soldierly courtesy and kindliness of character. But the Los Angeles Herald described him more succinctly, saying he lived a most eventful life. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.